All right, uh, my name is Andrew Gaffney. I'm going to be talking today about graphics rendering in the browser. Um, kind of starting with its history and moving to current standards of how it's done. The first thing I'm going to talk about is S SVG and early 2D graphics. Uh, since 2001, the standard for 2D image rendering on the web was a format called SVG. Um, SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. It was, it was developed as an open standard by the W3C. Uh, for those who don't know, the W3C is a standards organization that determines and develops uh, a lot of the standards for modern web browsers. Uh, it was founded and is still chaired by Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the internet. Um, it became a recommendation of the W3C ahead of uh, six competing uh, graphics formats that were submitted in 1998. Uh, it beat out graphics formats that were developed by Adobe, by Microsoft, by Boeing, to become kind of the general standard for web rendering. Uh, it's a vector-based graphics format, which means that it uses calculations of points in a graph to render polygons that represent the image. Uh, <coughs> this is a, opposed to the rasterization, which is, uses bitmaps. Um, I have an example of the difference between vector graphics and raster graphics. So you see in the vector graphics, when an image is scaled up, it maintains its clarity because everything is being done by a calculation of points on a graph. However, when you scale a bitmap up, um, it loses its clarity because the pixels are just being enlarged. Um, this isn't to say that vector graphics have an inherent uh, advantage over raster graphics. They're usually do, used to do different things. Um, in fact, uh, almost all modern displays are rasterized. So even if you use vector graphics to construct your images, they're converted to a bitmap when they're actually rendered to the display. All right, so getting to one of the first standards, Adobe Flash and its rise and fall. Uh, from the early 2000s, really, to almost the end of the 2000s, uh, Flash was probably the most commonly used platform for rendering both 3D and video on the browser. Uh, with the advent of HTML5, however, the, population, the popularity of Flash began to slowly but surely decline. Um, Flash, for a long time, had a lot of disadvantages. Uh, one of the main things is that it caused greater strain on the CPU because it, rendered, it did all its render processing on the CPU rather, rather than on the GPU. Um, one of the others is that uh, it required external software to the browser. So everybody remembers having to install Flash Player separately so that things could run in your browser. Uh, additionally, uh, Adobe kept Flash as partially closed source-wise for a long time. Um, that means that it was not easily portable, like people couldn't edit it and help develop standards for new web browsers and help uh, improve its functionality. Uh, at the current time, Adobe has actually addressed a lot of these concerns, like most of the rendering for modern Flash is done on the GPU. Uh, it, <coughs> it started an open source initiative. However, it may be too little too late for Flash. Uh, it's slowly being unsupported uh, by a lot of browsers like YouTube now. Although it started with Flash, has defaulted to HTML5 video and many other sites. Apple has never supported Flash, so. All right, and we get to one of the things that has caused the downfall of Flash, which is the canvas element. Uh, the Canvas element was initially introduced by Apple in 2004. It was initially a propri proprietary element, meaning that it was only for use in develop of their widgets and their browser, Safari. Um, this caused a lot of controversy when it was initially released. Uh, a lot of developers complained that, one, they should have supported the existing standard, which was SVG at the time, and they also if they weren't going to develop a new standard, they should have made it immediately open source, which they eventually did after much complaining. Uh, Canvas is an HTML5 element that comprises a drawable region of the display with a height and width. You see a simple example, you're setting the width and height. And the interesting I guess, caveat about setting the height and width of the Canvas element is that you do, if you do it with CSS uh, and not in line on the element itself, uh, 
and you're not using the default size of the element, it will actually attempt to scale the element to the size, or attempt to scale the drawable region of the display to the size of the element, which can cause some unwanted side effects like incorrect scaling of pixels and things like that. So it's best to usually, if you want to set the drawable surface to the same size as your canvas element, to just do it in line. All right, uh, some of the differences between SVG and the canvas element. Uh, so SVG maintains something very similar to the React Virtual DOM called a scene graph. Uh, this graph keeps track of all of the uh, images or objects rendered in the, in the scene uh, and renders them to a bitmap. It then, when it notices anything or any attributes of those objects changing, it automatically triggers a re-rendering of the scene and like the React Virtual DOM, it determines how to do that as efficiently as possible. Uh, in contrast, uh, the canvas is rendered in immediate mode, meaning that as soon as an object is rendered, the canvas knows nothing about it. Uh, thus, if anything changes, the entire scene needs to be re-rendered again. In order to get similar functionality to a scene graph, uh, you have to use an external scene graph-like API. Uh, additionally, the screen graph enables event handlers, like on click. Uh, the canvas element does not do this. Uh, the canvas, in order for you to be able to interact with elements on the canvas element, you actually have to check that the area clicked uh, relates or match the area clicks coordinates with the element that's being drawn to the canvas. Uh, <coughs> WebGL and the advent of 3D rendering in the browser. So WebGL came out of uh, Canvas 3D experiments, which were conducted by uh, an engineer at Mozilla named Vladimir Vukachevich. Um, he first demoed these in 2006, and by the end of 2007, both Mozilla and Opera had created separate, uh, complete implementations of WebGL. Uh, however, in 2009, a nonprofit group uh, called the Kronos Group started the WebGL Working Group. Uh, the WebGL working group included at its founding uh, Apple, Google, and Mozilla, and many others. It was basically uh, formed in order to provide a single standard for WebGL, and in 2011, it released 1.0 of WebGL. So what is WebGL? Uh, WebGL, or the Web Graphics Library, is a JavaScript API for rendering 3D graphics. Uh, without any external plugins. WebGL can be executed natively in the browser. Uh, WebGL uh, has by this point been completely integrated into all web standards of modern browsers, uh, allowing for the GPU uh, to accelerate image processing, physics calculations, visual effects, and any type of rendering that needs to be done. Uh, as I mentioned, WebGL uses the HTML5 canvas element and can be accessed using anything really that can interface with the DOM. Uh, WebGL programs are composed of control code written in JavaScript, uh, which is probably how you most often inter interact with it. However, if you really want to get into how the rendering and shading is done of the objects that you're rendering on the screen, you can use a language similar to OpenGL shader language, which is what WebGL is based around, uh, and that's in a language similar to C and C++. And as I said, WebGL programs are executed on the system's GPU. Uh, so that's the end of my slides, but I do have a demo. So hopefully it's working, which it doesn't seem to be. So why isn't this working? Oh, it is working. OK. So as you saw, I just instantiated a three-dimensional cube onto the screen. Um, this is using a simple library called 3JS with a physics library called PhysiJS built on top of it. Um, so how this works, basically, is uh, I guess one of the major challenges to getting this to work was that, uh, as I said before, you can't dira interact directly on uh, elements that are being rendered in the canvas element. So what 3JS does is something called ray casting. 
So ray casting uh, shoots a ray from the point of the mouse on the screen into the three-dimensional space that's being rendered and returns all of the objects um, that that ray hits. That way you know what you're interacting with. So I can keep doing this. I can shoot them up into the air. They have physics. And uh, yeah, so Fizzy.js uh, is built on top of um, a JavaScript library called Ammo.js, which is in turn based on another library called Bullet. Um, so there's a lot of like building on top of other people's work that goes into physics and graphics rendering. And uh, I encourage anyone who's interested in any type of uh, re rendering to check out 3JS. The documentation is pretty good. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, one criticism I have of it is that unlike some other, I guess, visual uh, rendering software, that there is no visual um, component to actually manipulating the scene. Everything has to be done in code, so you just have to kind of trust when you run your code that things will be in the scene where you want them to be. And uh, other than that, uh, that's pretty much all I got for you today.